And since the people of Pistoia revered the name of Nicola, father of Giovanni, they had Giovanni make a marble pulpit for the church of Sant'Andrea. Towards the end of the 13th century, Giovanni Pisano was the most talented and innovative sculptor in Europe. He helped make sculpture one of the leading art forms. The culture of Frederick II of Swabia reached Tuscany thanks to his father Nicola, who came from the court workshops in southern Italy. His son Giovanni upset the classical harmonious canon, dramatizing sculpture according to the new Gothic style. The pulpit in Pistoia, as well as others by Pisano in the cathedral and baptistry in Pisa and in the Metropolitan Cathedral in Siena, display a complex and detailed range of symbols in their different component parts. These blend together to form a single piece of architecture and sculpture. The work was moved from its initial location in the church, and so the precise original layout of the sculptures is unknown. The body of the pulpit, nevertheless, still represents the image of the celestial city. Various parts of the work depict the topic of the apocalypse. The symbols evoked by the sculpted figures tell a story of wisdom, which is part of the series of images found throughout the medieval city. The scenes provide a visual rendering of the preacher's explanations of the scriptures as they spoke to the faithful gathered around the pulpit and pointed them towards salvation and moral edification. So Giovanni finished his work in four years, dividing it into five stories from Jesus Christ's life, as well as a universal judgment which he made with utmost care. Begun in 1298, the pulpit was finished in 1301, as shown by the inscription above the edicula. It is a true masterpiece which takes sculpture to the level of architecture. The pulpit is hexagonal in shape, supported by six red marble columns at each vertex, plus a central column. The columns are approximately four meters tall and placed on white marble plinths. Two of the bases are shaped like a lion. The central base has the form of an eagle, a griffin, and a winged lion, while a fourth base depicts Adam in the guise of Atlas. The five panels of the balustrade, with scenes from the life of Christ in high relief and the surrounding decorative figures, are sculpted from Carrara marble. However, the incredible scene we see today is not the same as the original image as the base of the panels were formerly covered by a thin layer of glass with gold, red and green ornaments. There is little documentation of this pulpit's long history. In the 17th century, the work was removed from its original position and placed halfway up the left-hand aisle, squeezed between two columns and close to a wall. When it was reassembled, the vertical order of the panels and base figures was changed. This, in turn, altered its interpretation. Structural work was carried out in the 19th century with the insertion of iron rods and stone where it was missing. Today, the two book stands on the top part of the pulpit have been removed. The one from the Gospel side representing the Eagle of St. John is found in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, while the other from the Epistle side is in the State Museum in Dahlem, Berlin. For some time, there has been concern over the structure of the pulpit owing to the imperfect reassembly, together with changes in the aquifer in the ground below and other possible issues in need of investigation. The scientific committee set up to ensure the conservation of the pulpit has started a series of studies and investigations to identify the actual dynamic behavior of the pulpit. The knowledge of shape and the geometry are the basis of any preliminary study to the restoration works. 
Today, we are talking about accurate three-dimensional digital models made with measurement methods and techniques typical of geomatics. The 3D models created in this way provide a sort of digital twin of reality that allows the cognitive study of the original and to simulate those operations that could not be carried out without altering the work. In particular, I am referring to the decomposition of the pulpit into its elements, the virtual reconstruction of the original state and the simulation of the restoration works. Against this background, the metric model, created from the measurements made by GECO Lab at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering in the University of Florence, will also be useful for structural evaluation of the work. By calculating the correct inclination of the columns and the distribution of the panel's mass, we can build a reliable numerical model which can reproduce and estimate the dynamic behaviour of the structure. Lastly, let us not forget its communicative impact. The 3D representations created will enable us to explore, in virtual or augmented reality, a range of approaches for the different categories of users. In terms of the digitizations, the difficulties that the pulpit presents are by no means negligible. These stem from the lack of light and the formal characteristics of the work, with very uneven reliefs and figures sculpted at different levels. The whole structure is covered by sculptures, with some figures that jut out a great deal, drapery, deep shadows and hidden parts. The pulpit is a small piece of architecture with the wealth of details typical of sculpture. We have to be able to read minute details of the figurative parts with their dramatic expressions and meticulously carved figures, as well as material and structural aspects, such as tiny cracks and traces of glazing and colour. In order to be able to appreciate every detail of this work, it has to be observed close up. However, its current distance from the observer makes it difficult to understand. The traces of coloured glazing behind the reliefs, edges of gilded clothes and words on scrolls that originally helped to provide a better reading of the work can only be appreciated from a very close distance. The 3D survey is often the least evident step in a restoration project and yet it is the basis for all the preliminary analyses and for the project itself. In order to plan the intervention, it is fundamental to document the geometry and materials of the object. This enables assessment by other technicians and researchers, even at a later date, and another page in its history to be written. In particular, the creation of the topographic control network is the least noticeable phase in the survey, as there are no evident traces of it in the 3D models of final outputs. This phase determines the position of just a few points, while the laser scans and photogrammetry generate models with millions of points. And yet the control network plays a fundamental role. Several survey campaigns have been carried out in this church using different tools and methods. Therefore, it is essential to produce a stable reference system in which all the data can converge. What is more, thanks to a stable framework, we can monitor the conditions of the object and verify if and how much it changes in time. All the data recorded using the different geomatic techniques are connected using targets in the unique reference system. These targets are signals that are positioned on the survey site and measured both topographically and with the laser scanner or photogrammetry. The first measurement determines the position of the targets with respect to the control network, while the second establishes how the data needs to be transformed in order to be expressed according to the same reference system. The point clouds are created using scan systems and digital photogrammetry, together with topographic surveys that guarantee high quality results. They are the best possible way to provide a 3D representation of the reality. What we are looking at now is the 3D version of what photography was when it was first invented. In practice, this result is obtained without any interpretation of the data. It is the product of a series of operations which, 
if well planned and carried out correctly, lead to a 3D photograph of reality. With photogrammetry, we can reconstruct the shape of an object and its position in space, starting from photographs which give a 2D representation. We use the most up-to-date geomatic techniques to survey the pulpit of Giovanni Pisano and as a result created its digital twin. This twin will provide fundamental knowledge on the form and size of every part of the work. It will also represent the condition of materials making up this important monument, as well as its state of conservation. Using this twin, we will be able to explore how the parts might have originally been set out and provide a virtual simulation of a potential new location inside the church for the future. Il lavoro che quindi questa soprintendenza ha ritenuto necessario avviare è un lavoro di indagini, di studio, di, analisa, di analisi finalizzato alla comprensione del funzionamento statico del pulpito, alla individuazione degli interventi di consolidamento e di restauro per poter garantire la conservazione di uno dei capolavori davvero più rilevanti della scultura occidentale. Tutto questo lavoro di indagini e di analisi consentirà di precisare e di definire il migliore intervento di restauro di questo capolavoro, che potrà comprendere, integrare l'intervento di restauro anche forse parziali e limitati smontaggi della sua struttura. Hence, a method is defined one that includes and provides for the creation of a project of representation in which all the virtualities of space manifest in the consciousness of the present. <laughs>